So the, the first piece of this cultivation of open-heartedness is just this intention to offer our presence. And it's amazing, if you go into an encounter and something in you says, okay, this time just let me see how much I can just be there, you know, really attentive. Um, you'll find you get lost really quickly, but there's a little more remembering than there was before and a little counts a lot, okay? So that's the first piece. The second is um, to be one of the most beautiful heart trainings in the universe, and that is to intentionally look for the goodness. This isn't a, a Pollyanna thing. This is a recognition that we have deep survival conditioning to look for what's wrong. It's really part of our biology to, to attend to where there might be a problem. It's part of survival. So to begin to counter that conditioning and enlarge our sense of what's true, to intentionally look to see the goodness is powerful and beautiful. Powerful and beautiful. There's a, a quote from Thomas Merton I wanted to share with you tonight. The saints are what they are, not because their sanctity makes them admirable to others, but because the gift of sainthood makes it possible for them to admire everybody else. You just don't imagine a very realized being going around with a lot of judgment, you know? There's a, 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 a kind of fundamental uh, resonance, a fundamental capacity to see behind personalities to what's shining through. that receptivity then leads to a kind of active expression of love, which is the third quality. So, unconditional presence, looking for the good, and then expressing out of what we see our care, expressing it, saying it, vibrating it, praying it, in some way living it. So, story for you. Uh, I've, I've mentioned in past months, a very dear friend in our community, Jesse, who last year uh, was rushed to the hospital with heart trouble and lung trouble. And um, at one point it got so dire that, the, that his parents were called in uh, by the doctors and they were told that it's time to prepare to let him go. You know, he was on all sorts of life supports and it wasn't working. And um, it turned out they found a heart donor and he got a heart transplant and um, sp he spent six months in hospitals and he is in recovery. And he's he was back at our last retreat. And uh, he was interviewed as part of our Finding True Refuge project. So he's on, we have a video interview of of really how he called on his practice and on meditation and on loving presence to help get him through. And so first off, I want to invite you to, to go to check out the Finding True Refuge uh, video because I think you'll love it. But I just want to share a piece with you, which is at about the worst point for him. Jesse describes realizing his life would never be the same. He was never going to be the person he thought he was. I mean, he was a very, very hard-driving, successful, incredibly creative, productive, you know, always on the go. His life would never be the same, but not only that, he might not have a life. He really got it. And um, very, very fragile. And he was with his girlfriend. They were together for the night, and she, was by his, she had been by his side, continuously taking care of him. Well, on this night, he was r feeling the loss of everything and he was trying to rub her shoulders or in some way give back because she had been giving so much. But at one point she said, no need, that's enough, you don't have to. And then she looked at him and she said, you're enough for me. You're enough. And as he says, and to me this is the teaching, like, what greater gift could there be to let someone else know you're enough? 
Well, for him that totally connected him with that kind of belonging. He says, not just in there, in here, where it, true refuge is not just in here, it's in this belonging, this field of loving. It connected him and as it turns out the next morning he asked her to marry him and they are getting married soon. And he's doing a lot better. When we are facing death, if you ask yourself, if you knew you only had a few moments, what would matter? For many of us what we'd realize is to feel the truth of loving presence, to feel our belonging to love. So this, this pathway of awakening our heart gives us a refuge in the face of everything. So we begin our practice of loving-kindness and it's called the metta practice. Uh, metta means loving-kindness, it also means friendliness, with these simple uh, trainings in looking to see the goodness and then offering care. So just the way uh, Jesse's partner had looked at him and saw the goodness, you're enough, and she'd offered those words. I mean, what kind, that's a beautiful blessing. She gave him such a gift. That's the metta practice. We see the goodness, we offer our blessings. And, and when we're doing it in a silent meditation, it's in the form of some sort of a prayer. You think of somebody you deeply care about, and in some way you sense their goodness, and you say, oh, may you be happy, may you truly be happy. May you be filled with loving presence. May you touch natural great peace. May you accept yourself just as you are, whatever the prayer is. So we're both seeing the goodness and out of our feelings of care expressing it, because it's in the expression that it fully flowers. Does that make sense? It's, it's not just recognizing, there's an activity of expressing love. Now, in the formal practice, it's, it's described as widening circles, where we start with either a benefactor or we start with ourselves, and then we expand it to somebody that's easy to love and then to a person we don't know so well, where we don't have strong, pleasant or unpleasant feelings, and then to somebody who's difficult, and then to all beings. And that's the, that's the classic practice. But it's an absolutely creative, personal experiment for you. Whatever way of paying attention softens your heart, opens your heart, brings that moisture, that tenderness, that's a loving-kindness practice. We're going to end the time together with a brief one, but just want to share a little bit of some of the blessings of, of loving-kindness, whether you're offering or receiving, because they're both blessings. And one of the real gifts is that when there is a field or atmosphere of loving-kindness where there's this open-hearted attention, healing happens. It just does. When we sense belonging to our body or to another, we relax and that flow I described of blood and of lymph and of electrical currents and of chi, it happens. Illness is blockage, healing is flow. In the early 1900s, uh, many infants were known to waste away in institutions and die, and it was often unknown how come. In fact, on their admission cards, what it would say for these seriously sick infants, the words would be there just described as hopeless. So one of the interns that was um, following around a very famous physician, and the physician's name was Dr. Talbot, um, just trailed him because he was having unusual success in diagnosing what was going on with these infants. So he trailed him for a while and then he wrote up one that was a very, one very curious and regular occurrence and that's what I want to share with you. After examining one of these infants, Dr. Talbot would write on the child's chart in a legible scrawl. But within days the child would miraculously begin to gain color to eat more food or move around with more ease and vitality. 
curious, this guy asked this station nurse, what was the diagnosis and what was the prescription, okay? And, oh, she said, and then she just pointed to the corner of the nursery where a matronly woman sat rocking a child. She said, oh, it's old Anna. When nothing works, he has a child spend time with old Anna and just does it, you know, within a few days. Now think of it. This is, you know, you can find this somewhere. I don't know where I got this story, but you can find it probably if you Google. But it's not, we don't need to prove it to ourselves. We know it. When there is that grandmotherly, loving, rocking, nourishing, loving presence, we thrive. It's the grounds of healing. Life is fragile. This is a bumper sticker. Life is fragile, love is the glue. (laughs) Okay, so that's one of the gifts of this awakening. The other gift that um, is as fundamental as it goes is that in the moments that we completely feel bathed by love or that it's moving through us to another, the sense of self and other disappears. There's sometimes this question that comes up in Buddhist circles with, you know, two Buddhists, which is, well, isn't this practice of meditating on other people and offering them prayers, doesn't that kind of reinforce duality? But here's, the re- here's what really happens. It is a skillful means, it's a tool. But what you find is the more you get sincere and you have in mind another person and you're seeing their goodness, and your sincerity of saying, may you trust yourself just as you are, may you feel filled with loving presence, the more that's sincere, your own uh, armoring starts dissolving. And then you discover the truth of non-separation. There's not a self over there so much. You realize that, that one beingness, that life, that tenderness, that's really who we are you realize that there's only one of us here. All different expressions, one awareness. I read you the poet Hafez. I have learned so much from God that I can no longer call myself a Christian, a Hindu, a Muslim, a Buddhist, a Jew. The truth has shared so much of itself with me that I can no longer call myself a man, a woman, an angel, or even a pure soul. Love has befriended her face so completely at its turn to ash and freed me. Love has befriended so her face so completely it has turned to ash and freed me of every concept an image my mind has ever known. Love has befriended Hafez so completely it has turned to ash and freed me of every concept and image my mind has ever known. So these practices of cultivating and awakening our heart actually go beyond any ideas. We start there maybe with an idea of an other that we want to send love to. But then we get catapulted into this sense of belonging and oneness, no separation, that there's just one of us here and our hearts freed. And then there's still the conventional reality playing out but there's just love that flows through the who we are. And we know that as more deeply what we are than any of the defenses that we're familiar with or any of the aggression. That can still play out but there's this quality of um, of forgiveness and tenderness that recognizes it and it doesn't get fueled. So that too dies out some. Freedom. So, 
part of closing just to say that every one of us, and we wouldn't be here, or we wouldn't be listening, or we wouldn't be watching if there wasn't some intuition of this oneness, of this belonging, as possible, you know, as possible to realize something as into its possibility of loving without holding back, and we long for it. And what we find is that it's contagious, that when we're around someone who's inhabiting that reality more fully, it helps us melt. It's like ice cubes melting, you know? it's like the warmth and energy, it, we don't have to protect ourselves from them. So we dissolve a little and then we sense, oh, it really is just water washing around. Yeah, I have a little ice cubiness, but you know, I'm made of water. It's contagious, we do help each other melt. In fact, one person described it as this, he said, my spiritual teacher is whoever around me in this moment whose heart is more relaxed and open than my own. My spiritual teacher is whoever's around me in this moment whose heart is more relaxed and open than my own." Which usually makes it our dog, right? (laughs) Okay. All right, let's, uh, let's close a little bit of practice, bring this back to what can touch our lives immediately right here. And as you come into stillness and bring the attention inside, again, feel your own sincerity of intention, that even in these very few minutes, that that aspiration, may this way of paying attention awaken my heart. May this heart soften and open. And to the extent that you feel any blockage or distraction, reactivity right here in this moment, see if it's possible to forgive it. And that doesn't mean forgive it as if it's bad and you're forgiving, it means that you're really acknowledging, okay, this too, it's okay. You're practicing loving-kindness with what's difficult in the moment. If my heart's feeling numb or angry or judgmental, sometimes I'll just whisper the words, forgiven, forgiven. And just the intention to forgive begins to open the door and soften, melt the ice cubeness a little. So bringing to mind the person you were considering before that you'd like to have more intimacy with, less separation. And just for a moment, appreciate your own intention, that, that it's coming from a place of caring about love and its source is love, even if it's love that is caught up a bit in fear or hurt, it's still coming from love. So to take a moment to appreciate the goodness of your own intention, it's really important. It's like you're saying thank you to this sincerity that's here, your own goodness, it's got an innocence to it, that in us that longs to connect. And taking the other person into your awareness, just bringing your attention to the other and just imagine that person right here. So you could see or see the eyes, 
his or her eyes. And take a moment to sense what this person's like when he or she's really loving or happy, when he or she's more free. The look in that person's eyes, their smile, their whole countenance, when they're when he or she's just more relaxed or at ease. So you can sense the goodness that expresses when that person's not afraid or not in some way needing something to be different. Sense what you appreciate about this person, maybe the way he or she expresses love or curiosity or creativity, patience, helpfulness. And as you sense that goodness, let it touch your heart that that person, like all beings, wants to be happy and doesn't want to suffer. That person wants to live from their goodness. The Buddha said, there is a light that shines beyond all things on earth, beyond us all, beyond the highest heavens. This is the light that shines in our hearts. Sense that light in that other being so you can see past the veil and just sense that light, that goodness. In some way, imagine that you could let that person know about his or her goodness. In some way. And notice how that person responds when you do when you in some way let them know your appreciation of their goodness. You might even mentally wish for the words, thank you, for your beingness. And you might whisper whatever prayer you have for that person whatever you wish for that person. And as you do, let it be as sincere as possible. Imagine them experiencing what you're wishing for them. and sense the belonging, the connection that happens when you're appreciating and reaching out in this way. The freedom it brings to your own heart. And then just letting that heart be as open as it is, so you can visually, visually sense your own heart as this vast space where there's just a flow of aliveness, that the whole world's aliveness can flow through your heart that fast, a heart as wide as the world. Sensing that heart, including the sounds above us and around us and way, way beyond. Just letting it all live through your heart. Sensing all the beings that are in your heart. You just might have images of friends or family. Images of those that you don't know so well, but sense how all beings live. Anybody you can imagine is part of this heart. And all beings, all creatures, the birds, the deer, the fox, the flowers, all live in this heart, in this vastness, in this flow, there's a luminosity. The Buddha says, there is that light, 
It shines beyond all things on earth, beyond us all, beyond the highest heavens. This is the light that shines in our hearts. May all beings everywhere realize their essence as loving presence and may all beings live their lives as an expression of loving presence. May this bring a healing and peace to earth, a peace everywhere. May all beings awaken and be free. Namaste.